Hello and welcome to It Started With A Kick, the podcast in which well-known fans and high-profile figures in the world of football talk about the first match they ever attended. I'm your host, Richard Foster, and I'm absolutely delighted to introduce today's guest, Guy Mowbray. Guy started his broadcasting career in the 1990s with the famous Club Call Network and also working in local radio in his hometown of York and also moving to the Northeast. His first TV role was with Eurosport uh, and then he moved to ITV in 99. Um, interestingly, I think I'm right in saying, Guy, you're celebrating your 20 years at the BBC today or this year. Um, and obviously as the main commentator on Match of the Day and covering all the major tournaments, Euros and World Cups, uh, you will know Guy's voice very well. Guy, pleasure to have you on the pod. Really looking forward to digging into your early memories of football starting with that all-important first match. Can you tell us a little bit about the first game? Not a lot. Yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> um, no, not a lot. I wish, I really wish I could give you the whole fever pitch, wonderful description of the pitch being a lurid green and all that. But actually, my first match, I don't have too much recollection of. Um, I went with my brother, who's nine years older than me, and I rather suspect he's not a great football fan, and I suspect he was press ganged into taking me because I used to nag about going to a game. Um, and it was York City at home to Peterborough in 1979, I think. Um, I, I believe they lost 2-0. I'm not entirely sure about that either. York, that is. Um, Division 4, it would have been. Um, I think Charlie Wright would have been the York City manager at the time. We had uh, we had a succession of managers back there. We weren't very good. We used to have to reply for apply for re-election in the days before relegation to the conference. That that was a that was something that was passed to me that a thing that happened. Um, and I don't have too many memories of it, uh, but it was the starting point of, of going to games regularly, be it at York, be it at, at Leeds, Middlesbrough, uh, Leicester. My brother went to university in Leicester, um, so that that became a regular haunt, Filbert Street. Um, so yeah, just just great early memories of all the games, and I mean, I just devoured every bit of football going, everything that was on television, which, as you'll know, was was pretty sparse back then. Um, but you know, that I was allowed to stay up to watch Sports Night every now and again, which was just a just a massive treat. Grandstand and World of Sport and Match of the Day and the Big Match and Shoot, which we had in in the Northeast as well, they were all just just an integral part of my childhood. Excellent. Well, I've done a little bit of research for you guys oh, that first game, and you're absolutely correct. Uh, York unfortunately lost 2-0 to Peterborough, uh, and it was the 8th of September 1979, and a chap called Tommy Robson, who I must admit I had to look up, scored both goals for Peterborough. Right. Uh, it was at Bootham Crescent, uh, and there was a, a crowd of 3,102, which at the time was a record attendance in that season. And <laughs> I've got a little reveal for you here. The reason the gate was boosted was because mm. there was a debut for a chap called Peter Lorimer. Now, that, that was why I suspect that um, I was able to go. Um, I, 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 I suspect there must have been a bit of buzz about that. Um, I do remember. I do remember Peter Lorimer playing for York. Yeah, so yeah, that 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 would be it. That would tie in. Because I also did a little bit of um, research with. And I'm um, indebted to Michael of the Y Front website and also Paul Bowser, the club historian. I, I know them both well, and they are fonts of everything that is good about York City, which at the moment there's not a lot of. Indeed, indeed. Uh, and I asked them to turn on the tap for information. I was absolutely deluged with information, so I now know more about York than I have ever done before. Mm. But um, looking, looking at Lorimer, so this was his debut, and he'd spent all that time at Leeds, um, and he was all just before he left Leeds in that spell. He was only three off John Charles's record appearances, and of course he went back and then was the record appearance maker. But it's just interesting to for for an outsider to see someone like Lorimer get involved with York, you know, because you're going from Leeds, who were you know preeminent side in the first division. Then going down to the fourth division, you say, and York weren't exactly ripping up any trees at the time. Um, so, in the local press, uh, Malcolm Huntington, I think, who's a very well known local press man, and, and, a, did, and a very, very well respected Wimbledon tennis umpire, who very famously had an argument with John McEnroe on centre court. 
Indeed. Well, quite a few of them had that, didn't they? But um, his nickname, do you remember what his nickname was, Lorimer? It was Hotshot, wasn't it? Or something along well, those lines. Actually, they called him Thunderfoot. Ah, so right, got, there we go. I've got the press release here. Thunderfoot steps out. So this was all the hoo-ha and the big media build-up to the Peterborough game. And then, unfortunately, you did lose 2-0. Um, I'm, I'm afraid to report that in the re the uh, match report, there is uh, a little line saying, Lorimer and Foster lectured after a first-half skirmish. Now, I must tell you, that is not a relation <laughs> I, I've double checked, and we never had anybody in the Foster family who played for Peterborough United. Right. Um, so, looking through um, the the Lorimer, you know, because I think Lorimer's an interesting angle because then your second match, as we'll go on to later, was actually a Leeds game. Um, you look at his career, and actually, it's quite interesting because he went to Cape Town City on loan, which a lot of players did in that time. And it was the apartheid era. George Best did it. Bobby Moore did it. Right, uh, right. Actually, that, Roy Hodgson went across, didn't he? Roy Hodgson, like, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and that's why he got fewer Scottish caps because he was actually banned from playing for Scotland for a while. And also, he went to um, America for a bit and played for Toronto Blizzard before York, and then afterwards the Vancouver Whitecaps. So, you know, a much-travelled man. And, it, you know, it's, as I say, it's interesting to see how someone who was, you know, let's face it, he was an international star. He famously did have a thunderfoot because he scored some amazing goals, unfortunately didn't on that day. But, it, you know, he stayed with York throughout that season. Uh, I think he clocked up about 30-odd appearances. And then left and, and went back to Leeds. Uh, I, I would think there was an element of convenience in that because I know at the time, and, and obviously I've grown up devouring football knowledge and being passed it on from family and friends and what have you, and I, I know sort of the Leeds, Harrogate, York sort of corridor and triangle um, village near here, Poppleton, um, and I know a lot of the Leeds players sort of lived in the area, and I rather think it was probably, you know what, I live here, I might as well. Um, yeah. it, it was one of those so um, we've had a few like that over the years and actually quite a few players who join York from all over the country um, southerners northeasterners whatever they never leave there's a heck of a lot of ex-York players who are still here yeah yeah um, and so you, as soon as you'd been to that game and, you know, and you'd probably press ganged your, your brother into going did it? That was the York City in your veins. Um, did it then become a regular thing? Because I know there were a few months before you went to your next York game, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But also, we'll talk about your second game, which was the Leeds game. Was there something that struck you when you went to York, and also the fact it was at Booth and Crescent, which was you know a ground that I I never went to Booth and Crescent, but somehow I'm sort of attracted to it. I don't, it's just a nice name. It's got a nice feel to it. Mm. And obviously it didn't last uh, that much longer. But was there anything about the experience of going? Maybe, you know, as you say, it wasn't the allure of the green grass necessarily, but, but the stadium itself, was that something that, you know, you got used to and you, you, you then went to, you know, a regular spot at Booth and Crescent, whether it was standing, probably was, or sitting. It, it would have been the whole package for me because I was yeah. just a football obsessive. As I said, Shoot Magazine, Match Magazine, you know, every everything. I, I Roy the Rovers, every annual at Christmas and beyond, I, I, I devoured everything. So it would have been the whole package. Um, we used to play on a Saturday afternoon. Uh, my, my house, our house, um, backed onto a playing field where our local village team, Osbaldwick, played, who um, who were actually all conquering at the time as well. They won every York and District Senior League Championship for a good few years. So yeah. we, we would play. As soon as the goal nets were erected, we'd be in them, playing in them before the game started, then playing against them on the back of them during the game half the time, using the back of the net as a goal of our own. Um so, so, so it was just constant. That's all I did. That's all I did, basically, from dawn till dusk, every single day. And if I wasn't playing it, I was watching it or reading about it. Um, so the whole to, to start going to games, yeah, the, the whole package would have appealed to me. I remember the Peterborough game. We definitely were behind the goal. Um, it was also bred into me. York City was never really an option. My, my dad was born and bred in the city. And he went to, I think, every game of the 1955 FA Cup run when they got to the semi-finals. Uh, beating Spurs along the way. And then they went out to Newcastle, who went on to win the Cup and haven't since. 
Um, uh, yeah, they they won the cup that year. But in the semi final, I remember at Hillsborough, I've been told that well before any sort of technology, only Pathé News recording it then. Um, yeah, York had a goal that was ruled out, saying it hadn't crossed the line, and everybody there, everybody there said it clearly had. And, uh, and yeah, Newcastle went on to win thanks to Jackie Milburn and co, and won the cup. So York's always been bred into me. My dad had a hiatus period around about that time in sort of late 70s where he wasn't going much anymore, partly because of bringing the family up. Um, mm -hmm. But but then he started taking me again a little bit more. Um, and and we, we would either go in the popular stand, which was ironically named. Um, it was opposite the main <laughs> stand. Um, we would go in there because it was only it was only a matter of pennies and then it became a pound for years to transfer from the, the Shipton Street end behind the goal into the seats. Or when I went with my mates, when I was you know, a couple of years older and we used to go on our own, it was drilled into us to stand in the corner by the corner flag um, okay. because you could see all of the pitch from there. I was always told you could see all of the pitch and you're away from the melee behind the goal. Um, so we always used to stand in the corner, the right-hand corner, just near the transfer to the popular stand. Um, if, if we had a little bit of spare pocket money, we occasionally might pay the little upgrade and go and have a seat, but not very often. Ooh. Um, yeah, and, and our goal was always to join the big kids behind the goal in the Shipton mm -hmm. Street end. And um, yeah. yeah, we did that obviously regularly over the years. Um, yeah, I was definitely there with my brother in '79 when for the Peterborough game behind the goal. And yeah, that must have that must have stirred something in me. Um, but Booth, Booth and Crescent was special. I mean, it only shut down a few years ago. Now. Well, I can't remember four years during COVID. Um, yeah. It, and, and the move was inevitable. It had to happen. It was falling down. Um, thankfully, we are in a really good new stadium now. It's a shame performances on the pitch can't match the place because it's been adopted pretty quickly, much quicker than any of us expected it. Um, people actually like it, and I like it. I love going, which which is nice because I thought the morning of Booth and Crescent would be would would go on a little bit longer than that. Um, but it was a, it was a, a really really special place for all its ramshackle nature. Um, the, the cater leisure trolley that used to be pushed around the perimeter of the pitch selling boiled burgers and lava hot bovril and um, <laughs> a very weak tea. Um, I, I, you know, the smell of that being pushed around, that just just all of the, the, the sights, sounds and memories of Boone and Crescent will, will, will never go away. That uh, A memory that everybody takes away from Boone and Crescent or did at the back of the ship to street and was the toilets, which were just abysmal, okay. abominable right. and strangely missed. It's a curious thing about the male psyche in this country, isn't it? That you, you, you remember it and you've moaned about it and it was horrible, but then you miss it when it's gone. A very, very strange thing, um, especially yeah. where that sort of stuff's concerned. But, yeah, I, I, I can remember every aspect about it. We all played our junior cup finals there as well. You know, as, a, okay. as an avid player, um, you know, I played, not long time, packed in play, to be honest, but you know, I've always played football as well. And it was the goal at the start of the season. The goal was to get to the cup final and play on the pitch. At, at York City, um, mm. which I was lucky enough to do several times, um, and so so that the whole thing was tied into the community. It was just just part of it. it. It was it was and always will be our home. It's the home of football. It, it is. Yeah, and uh, as we speak, I mean, I, I know this is a podcast and it's not a video, but behind Guy's right shoulder is a very nice framed picture of Booth and Crescent, and above that is a York City kit. And I wanted to talk to you about the kits because the kit had changed, I believe, just before your game. Yeah. So the game against Peterborough, you were wearing uh, red and blue. Uh, but I think it was even the season before had been the kit that certainly I associate York City with, and I think a lot of people do. So talk to me about the Y front. Yeah, well, the Y front, I'm the wrong person to talk to because, he's, as you say, it just slightly predates me. So I don't have any great love for it. And and, and I feel like some sort of heathen for saying that because, <laughs> because every York fan of a, of a vintage, that, you're right, that, that is the kit. Uh, and, it, and it coincided with going up to the second division in the mid-70s, um, playing Manchester United at home and away on a level footing in the league, you know, Nottingham Forest and, and et cetera, et cetera, being regulars on the big match and on match of the day every now and again for those two seasons when Division 2 was regularly covered by by the networks. Um, and yeah, the, the, the first season, I, I think I'm right in saying it, it was a, a maroon kit with a white Y on the great big white Y on the front of the shirt, white shorts and maroon socks. The following season, when they went back down to Division 3, it reversed and it was a, a white shirt with a maroon Y and white shorts and maroon socks. 
um, which I, I don't know if that went down well at all. It seemed, seemed to be reversed. Um, but then by the time I started going, the pattern had been set. York used to be red shirts, white shorts and red socks. And, and they were called the Robins, I think, for a while. Um, but then when I started going, it changed from the maroon and it had gone to red shirts, navy shorts and white socks, sure. which is quite unique. There was only York and Aldershot played with red shirts and blue shorts. Um, and so that is the kit. That is my kit. They are my colours. Um, right. And they always will be. And, and and yeah, a few years ago, they used to engage supporters every now and again with a vote for what the new kit should be. And if it wasn't red, blue, white, I would be dismayed. I could tolerate red, blue, red and have red socks. We had some good years with that combination. Mm -hmm. But it had to be blue shorts. And I've never liked it. The odd season where we haven't worn blue shorts, be they a brighter blue in 2012 when we came back into the Football League, it was a bit bit brighter. Um, or, or navy, as it should be. Um, yeah. And and now, the, the, the best thing about the team right now is that's exactly what they're playing, red, navy and white. And... Um, yeah, I really like our kit at the moment. But yeah, so the, the Y fronts are iconic, but they're just slightly slightly before me. So I don't mm -hmm. I don't really remember it that well. Um I do have, however, uh, I don't know if it was my dad's or my brother's, I, I have a maroon and white scarf from that era. Um, which curiously I do wear to games and, and it's always commented on. People like that a lot better than uh, <laughs> than the modern ones. So yeah. yeah, there's a lot of a lot of happy memories about that kit. And I, uh, you know, I, I think it, getting kit, getting memorabilia is, is, you know, also part of that initiation, if you like, into football. Because, you know, a scarf is uh, is a statement, a bobble hat's a statement, yeah. a rosette. You know, I remember the days of rosettes. Now, <laughs> that probably yeah. puts me in uh, a category beyond most people's knowledge. But uh, you know, I think that's really important as well. Is how you connect. What if I, I just, the, sorry, sorry to interrupt, yeah, if I can just, um, for the listeners, I'll just hold this up for you. I mean, the, the why okay. prevails. It is still a really important part. My, my coffee mug here is 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 on a, a York City coaster, which, as you can see, uh, yes. has the current club crest, but behind it is a great big white Y on a red background. And it Brilliant. still is part of the fabric of the club. Yeah, I think that's that's important because... It, also, from you know, when when I was growing up as a Palace fan, I, the only things I really remember are Glad all over, which you know is still booming out at Selhurst Park even forty odd years later. Um, for you, was there? I I, I I tried to find if there was a York City song. I couldn't really okay. wow. locate one, and also a mascot. Um, so. I, I heard that there was Yorkie the Lion, but I don't know if Yorkie the Lion was around when you were first going. No, no, we, we we didn't we didn't have mascots or any, anything yeah. like that. Didn't have time for anything like that. We're from Yorkshire. We don't indulge in silly things like that. <laughs> but, um, but over time, over time, yes, obviously changing times, and and that happens. And actually, it's a, it's somebody who I was at school with who regularly played Yorkie the Lion. Played. It's a bit grand, isn't it? He put a put a head on and a kit. Yeah. Um, right. But he and, and it's Steve, and he's a really good lad, and he, he he's hilarious at it. And actually, he's just he's just reprised the role. Um, he left right. it for a lot of disagreements with the management, etc. Um, <laughs> but he, he does it again now. He does it again right. now. At Yorkie, okay. they, they changed it for a while. And had Shippo the Lion, which was a bit more of a grand suit, standing in front of the Shipton Street end. The Shippo, so Shippo the Lion became a thing. Yorkie, yeah. I think, was all tied up with sponsorship as well with Nestle, uh, Rantries, as well. Um, but irrespective of it, he kept all the stuff. And so Yorkie is, again, York's predominant mascot, wearing the same old tatty kit that he used to wear. Um, okay. And long may that continue. He is our only mascot, quite honestly. Um, yeah, we, we, all, we all love Yorkie. Um, curious, isn't it? You're talking about kits. I think it's the era you, you grow up in and the era you start first watching football. They're the colours that stick. And, you know, I know Palace are, are, are red and blue, etc. But, you know, for me, Palace are white with a red and blue sash. White shorts, yeah. white socks. That's Crystal Palace. And I won't be happy until they return to that. <laughs> right. OK, I'll, I'll have a quick word with Steve Harris and see what we can do. <laughs> um, so just briefly going back to that first game. So the, the context is important, I think. So to give people, you know, the view that in that season, um, Liverpool won the first division, which was not unusual. West Ham won the FA Cup beating Arsenal 1-0, Trevor Brooking somehow scored a header. Yeah. Uh, and Forrest had 
took their second European Cup in succession. Whereas York, um, as you say, when you played that game, you were in threat of going into what is, you know, was re-election zone, which was the bottom four places. Um, so, and Peterborough were actually fourth at the time of that game. So they were going for promotion. So it wasn't a great surprise that York lost. Do you, do you remember, as you say, you consumed every aspect of football, whether it be magazines, um, radio, television, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Do you remember, you know, the Liverpool team and the Forest team doing that, you know, amazing thing of winning yeah. two successive European Cups after having been promoted up to from the second division and then immediately winning the first division, which, let's face it, will never happen again. Um, do, do, were you fully aware of what was going on in the oh, wider yeah. football world? Yeah, probably probably more aware of the wider football world than than the fact York City was struggling. To be honest, yeah, um, yeah I will. Have, yeah, I, every week I, I, the shoot league ladders were mm -hmm. were my Sunday morning ritual, and I still miss it to this day. Right. I still miss it, um, and I credit those and the facts that you got with them um, with huge parts of my football not not just football knowledge, actually geography knowledge, um, mm -hmm. knowing where places are and. I wish they were still a thing. I know I know the Match of the Day magazine does them in a form as a poster form. Um, and you can still do them. And I actually did that a couple of years ago, but the poster's fiddly. It's it's hard, they rip easily. It's quite hard. The the the, the solid cardboard with the cardboard tabs of the shoot league ladders yeah. were a wonderful thing. It had the ground name, the team nickname on them, little facts on the back. And so Sunday morning, the Sunday paper. Um, it was always for a while the Sunday Express in our house. It changed over years, but it was the Sunday Express that we used to pick up and go to. I would go straight away to the inside page, the league tables, all the results from the previous day. I would devour all the sc scorers, the goals and the scorers of them, um, of, of all four divisions and Scotland, obviously, as well. Um, and then I would do the league tables. And I wouldn't just do them once. I'd then look at them every day. I was yeah. I was aware of where everybody was. Now I'm ashamed to say I'm not beyond the Premier League. I'm not. It consumes so much of my life that I don't get the time to. You know, as an adult, it's such a shame that I don't get the time to properly dip into the other divisions. I would know every manager of every single club. I would know the kit colours. I would know once we got into the 80s. I would know who the sponsors were of every team, all the 92, and most of Scotland as well. Um, yeah. And, and and that's dipped over the years. And I think it's such a shame that everything's so instantly available with a click now that you look at it, but you don't take it in. Mm -hmm. uh, and back then I used to look at it every day and take it all in as well. And it's all stuck. Um, so I can't, sorry, Rich, I'm rambling. I can't remember what the question was. But no, that, no, no. We like rambling. We like rambling. Yeah, that's, that's, um, that's the sort of thing I miss. And, and, and that's, yeah, I was fully aware. That's I was fully aware of all the developments. I, I can actually quite vividly remember that that European Cup final for Forest, um, mm. watching it in a, a little bed and breakfast up in Northumberland on a family trip. Um, I can't remember the name of the play. I, I think it was called, not, not a surprise, it was called the Red Lion. I can't remember where it was, um, but it was up in Northumberland, somewhere in the countryside near the Cheviot Hills. And it was the days when, you know, you didn't, this, this will astonish some younger listeners, but you didn't have a television in your room when you went to stay in a little hotel or a guest house. Um, so they had a TV lounge. Um, of course. And I, and I remember being with a throng of people I didn't know, sitting in this TV lounge watching Forest win the European Cup. And that's yeah. that's imprinted on my brain. That's one of those that's one of those memories. And Liverpool winning everything, well they did. Um mm. and I could I could probably name you both well, I won't try, but I could probably name you the Forest lineup, the Liverpool lineup for much of the season. They probably only used twelve players all season anyway. Yeah. Um and all, all my mates were Liverpool fans because yeah when you grow up in York you have a you tend to have a big team as well. Um, they were all Liverpool fans. They dominated it. Um, so, so we used to go to Anfield every now and again. Um, if we're looking with Cubs, we used to have trips to get tickets. And once, twice a season, we'd either go to Anfield or Elland Road or Main Road, or you know, you, you, we we go to all these places. And all these all these things are stamped on my brain as as, as part of my football education. But uh, I, I yeah, I remember everything that happened that season. The cup final in particular. I mean, cup finals were just and still are to me. It's still the best day of the year. I still absolutely love it. I wish it was as it was, where 
it started at nine o'clock and infiltrated into kids TV and then yeah. went all the way through the build up and at the team hotel and it, it it was the greatest day as a kid. My my first one would that I would properly remember would be seventy seven, Manchester United beating Liverpool. Seventy six I vaguely remember when Southampton beat Man United. Um yeah. and then seventy nine I took everything in when Arsenal won beating United and, and eighty as well with Trevor Brookings header. That was um yeah, Ray yeah. Stewart on penalties, Phil Parks in goal. Yeah, Alan Devonshire, brilliant on the wing. What a team yeah. that was. What a Absolutely. team for the second division that was. Blimey. Well, yeah. And, and going back actually to those shoot ladders, um, I I think actually improved dexterity as well because it wasn't yeah. that easy to move the little tabs, was it? I mean, there was quite a little slot and you, you had to be yeah. quite careful. And, and I, th- I totally agree with you about geography. And mm. I think that now is spread out to the international world. So, you know, if you, my son, when he grew, grew up, understood where Croatia was. Yeah. Because he knew the team. He would have had, had no, okay, he did geography A level, but I doubt whether he'd have known where Croatia was. But because of the football, he knew what the flag was. He probably didn't know the national anthem. But, you know, it, it does help you. Oh, a perspective on on not only the UK but the whole world. Uh, funnily enough, uh, just yesterday I was sitting down having my lunch, sitting in the kitchen, TV on in the background. There was a quiz show on, and there was a list of place names in Europe, and they had to basically identify the ones that were in Poland. And there was a few names. There was um, Brno in there um, from Czechia and, and, and mm-hmm. various other places that were Zadar, I think Bosnia. Um, and various other places that weren't in Poland. You had to isolate those and, and get the ones that were in Poland. And I knew all of them from football clubs. I knew, I knew where every place was purely through the football club that played there. And, and yeah, yeah. it's... Uh, I, no, people... It annoys me, actually. Sorry, I've got, I've got a bit of a rant. It annoys me in schools still to this day how sport is just almost like... And, and in the media. And in the media, the mainstream media, when news is on. And, here, oh, here we go. Let's have a bit of sport at the end. Like it's an afterthought. Yeah. Here's the games. Oh, what fun. Um, yeah. You know, no, actually, you know what? You can get a much better education from following, you know, from football, from geography, et cetera, from cricket. You score a cricket match and you, your arithmetic and your your new your, your, yeah, your, your yeah. numeracy skills just improve immeasurably. Um, and, and things like that are just essential. And, and it, it just gets on my nerves still how sport is undervalued massively in the education system. There we go. Yeah. Runs yeah. over. <laughs> okay, Minister of Education. I hope you're listening to this. Um, and, and you mentioned cricket there. I know you're a big cricket fan. And you, yeah. you play. I think still um, had you went to York, uh, 1979. But had you been to a cricket match? Been to I don't know Headingley. Um, yeah. Is there something you can compare the football experience with? Let's say going to a cricket match, which let's face it is very different. Yeah, um, Scarborough. We used to go to the Scarborough Cricket Festival every year where Yorkshire would play there for a month, basically, throughout August. Um, mm-hmm. uh, my mum and dad were Yorkshire members, so we used to go to quite... I didn't go to Headingley for quite a few years, but we used to go to Scarborough every year. And w- what I do remember, I remember playing Nottinghamshire um, one summer's day. Um, I, we, we sat in... Because we were members, we sat in front of the players' pavilion and we're sitting in front of the Nottinghamshire seats and a very famous... Test cricketer played for Nottinghamshire in England. Derek Randall was sitting just behind oh, yes. and asked me for yeah, one of my sweets, and I refused. And I remember he, he typical Yorkshireman, <laughs> and I can, I can remember that now. Um, right. you know, getting berated by Derek Randall for not giving him one of my my toffees. Um, okay, and I, I would have been four or five years old back then. Um, and I, what what I will is the, I've never thought of it as a comparison, but thinking back now, what I do remember is there were certainly more people at the cricket than there were at York City. <laughs> yeah, well, probably just over three thousand. Oh yeah, there were a lot. Yeah. There were a lot more people at the cricket that day. So yeah, the, that 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 probably was the biggest crowd I'd ever experienced until until being taken to to Elland Road and Ayrson Park and, and 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 Anfield. You know, as the years went on. Yeah, um, I must say that I've always expressed disappointment when York got relegated out of the football league a little bit later because it meant that fewer. Uh, English league clubs began and ended in the same letter because I always loved that. And there were a handful 
and York were one of them. And then we had Aston Villa, Charlton Athletic, Liverpool, yeah. that. and then when York went, I went, oh no, that is so disappointing. <laughs> of course, yeah, that... there were a few littered in Scotland, but um, yeah, you know, the, the, English the disappointment was felt a bit more keenly with us, and probably will be again this year when regional football is once again beckoning. Ridiculous. Yeah. Is that how? Is that's what's happening to that? That's how bad it level. is. You know, despite a lot of investment and a lot of money behind the scenes, it's being completely wasted right now. And we look as though we're going back to National League North. What joy! Oh dear. Yeah, because it was nil all, wasn't it, against Kidderminster, which was a big relegation battle. Phil Brown, I noticed, was it, it, it was going all right, and now it's not. And it just that's the story of York City all my life, practically. Just when you think things are on the up, they will do something themselves somehow to completely kibosh it. And they've done it again. I don't know how, but they've managed it. 